We're up here in Big Cottonwood Canyon, and probably thousands of people drive by here on the way to the ski resorts every year, not really realizing what a fantastic story about ancient history of tides, the earth, and the moon is captured in these rocks that are almost a billion years old. Well, these are very fine-grained rocks, and these fine-grained rocks are the type of thing that even normal geologists like myself would kind of drive by. But one day, somebody brought me a cobble from the creek, Big Cottonwood Creek. Dr. Chan immediately realizes these rocks are like few others in the world. And we came up here, we started looking at some of these deposits and realized that really tell us an important story. Before these rocks formed the Utah mountains, they started life on an ocean beach. They're composed of ancient sand and mud. Over time, they hardened, preserving the sedimentary remains of the ocean's tidal rhythms. These are some of the oldest known tidal rhythms. And this is in a regime where we used to be sort of close to a shoreline, and the ocean would come up along the shoreline and move some of the sand and mud. And so some of the sand and mud gets preserved in these different lines in the rock. And the way these lines or these rhythms alternate back and forth is telling us something about how the tides operated almost a billion years ago. Dr. Chan keys in on the alternating pattern of lighter, thicker lines against darker, thinner ones. And some that are light colored are telling us about times when the tides were strong and when the earth and the moon and the sun were all aligned together. Um, those were some of the times when there was the greatest gravitational attraction, so those strong tides could move more sand. Tides are strongest when the sun aligns with the moon. That's when gravity of both masses simultaneously pulls at the ocean surface as they pass overhead. Twice a month, stronger tides, or spring tides, leave behind thicker, lighter layers. When the moon moves out of the sun's alignment, it causes weaker tides, or neap tides, twice a month. Neap tides allow finer, darker silt particles to settle, leaving thin, dark layers. To Dr. Chan, those alternating monthly layers are like tree rings, records of time laid down by the ancient environment. And that record tells her that time was flying back then. Looking at how many rhythms there are and seeing that there are perhaps more rhythms, more numerous, and that's maybe telling us that the Earth was spinning faster. So when the Earth is spinning faster, the days are shorter, and there's more days in the year. Four and a half billion years ago, Earth spins almost four times faster than today. Days are only about six hours, and Earth's axis is nearly straight at 10 degrees. But over the next four billion years, the moon changes all that. Early on, the moon was closer to the Earth, and so you have a greater gravitational effect on the tides compared to what you have now. And so the size of those tides is changing throughout time, being larger when the Earth and the moon are closer together because that distance between them is smaller. When the moon forms at around 20,000 miles from Earth, it's over 12 times closer than today. Earth's oceans appear shortly thereafter, and the moon pushes tides four times faster than those today. The liquid stretches across what little volcanic land exists, and the tide's friction against the Earth's rotation begins to slow our planet down. Over time, you have the tidal friction. The tides just moving back and forth across the surface of the Earth creates friction, and that also contributes to the slowing of the rotation of the Earth. Over the next three billion years, the continents form, and tidal friction slows Earth to about 18 hours per day. A half billion years later, days last 22 hours. Adding a fraction of a second every century adds up to our current 24-hour day. In a billion years, the moon's gravity on the tides could slow Earth's rotation down to 30-hour days. But gravitational pull between the Earth and moon goes both ways. And because Earth's mass is larger, it exerts more pull on the moon. The Earth has already slowed moon's axial rotation to only once a month. Looking at the moon, we always see the same face of the moon facing towards the Earth. And the reason is because we are in a synchronous lock, Earth and the moon. And so gravitationally, the moon 
is sort of stuck with its same face looking at the Earth all the time. And this is because the Earth-Moon system is so gravitationally tightly bound that we're coupled together. Earth's gravity has still another more profound effect on the Moon. When the Earth rotates, friction from its ocean beds drags the daily lunar tidal bulge slightly eastward, out of a direct Earth-Moon line. That bulge of water has so much mass that its gravity pulls the Moon forward in its orbit, causing the Moon to retreat farther and farther away from Earth. When you take a, a rock in, in a string, the faster you throw it, the further it goes out. And the same with the Moon, the faster it goes, the further it goes away. So the Moon is receding away from Earth. Based on geologic records over the last billion years from the Precambrian period, not only is the Moon retreating, it's picking up speed. And back in the Precambrian, the lunar retreat rate may, might have been somewhere around two centimeters a year. But now what we're seeing from some of the laser measurements is that the rate is now about 3.5 or so centimeters a year. So we can see that the moon is moving away faster. Now it happens to be large today, larger than the average over the last two and a half billion years because of the far-flung distribution of continents. When we had a single Pangaea continent, there was not as much interface, not as much friction. It was easier for the bulge to move back and forth when the Earth was mostly open ocean. As the moon continues its retreat, it'll cause our days to get longer and eventually throw our seasons out of balance, destroying life as we know it. To see what our future might look like without the moon's strong stabilizing presence, we can turn to our close neighbor for an answer. Mars. For the past 4.5 billion years, our moon has served as a protecting force for Mother Earth. It's created Earth's stable axis, predictable seasons, and ocean tides. But now the moon is retreating at an ever-increasing rate. So those life-giving constants are about to change. Clues as to what we might expect may exist 34 million miles away on Mars. Mars is kind of neat because we consider it kind of a sister planet. We can see a lot of similar features on Mars that remind us of Earth and a lot of different analogs. Mars and Earth have many features in common. They both formed around the same time and from similar rocky material. Mars's red color is a product of hematite, an iron compound found all over Earth. Like Earth, Mars also has ice caps. In 2004, scientists' knowledge of Mars expands with the landing of rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Close to its landing site, Opportunity finds tiny evidence with big implications. Scientists don't find liquid water, but they do find strong evidence for it in what appear to be riverbeds and concretions. Concretions are small balls of minerals stuck together like concrete. On Earth, concretions form when water leaches slowly through sediment, dissolving minerals that can harden into balls. A team of scientists is searching for earthen concretions to see what they may tell us about Mars's past, and perhaps our future. Okay, Johnny, um, yeah, here is a place where you see some uh, layers, and we'd like to get closer to it, so that's where we expect to find these uh, concretions. So, yeah, these layers are formed at a different time in the history of the Earth, and are what we find there are concretions uh, which are similar to the ones that have been found in, on Mars. The team tests a remote rover designed to one day explore Mars. So that's what we, we'd like to sample. If you could close up you know, to there. Again. Yes. Here, here this could be a, a good spot. Uh, so, we are going to get samples. 
This entire expanse of Utah desert was once the bottom of an ancient ocean. If the concretions on Mars were formed in the same way, that means that a large body of water was also present on Mars. If so, then like Earth, life on Mars would have been possible. So could we one day lose our liquid water? This is what Earth's future might look like without liquid water, a barren, lifeless rock. Like Mars, what water might remain would be frozen, mostly below Earth's dusty surface. It is interesting to think that Earth is a very dynamic planet compared to Mars, but Mars in its past history must have also been dynamic. And what's happened? Maybe there is some similarity in what our future might be. Mars's axis is 25 degrees, just one and a half degrees more than Earth's. Mars also wobbles periodically on its axis. But Mars's wobbles are far more drastic. Nearly 100,000 years ago, when Earth wobbled less than two degrees, it caused an ice age. Mars wobbles up to 60 degrees, producing a severe climate and creating an uninhabitable planet. That's because neither of Mars's moons are large enough to stabilize it like Earth's moon does. Mars's moons are not made from their mother planet, but captured by Mars's gravity as they passed by. So their gravitational effect on Mars is far weaker than our moon's effect on Earth. The Earth-Moon system is stable because it's locked in this rotation and the Moon is stabilizing that. And if you just have a sphere that's rotating, it's basically free to rotate in any direction it wants. Uh, and that can happen to planets that don't have a Moon to stabilize them, like Mars would have a, a kind of a, a more random warp of its axis. Our Moon's gravity works a bit like a brace, preventing the Earth from toppling over. Planetary scientist Dr. Jack Wisdom uses a simple gyroscope to illustrate. This gyroscope is like a child's top, only it's mounted inside a frame or gimbal whose axis is free to take any orientation. When set in motion, it behaves like a rotating planet. This is the regular procession. If we just hold this the gyroscope fixed without swaying the, the string. It's analogous to the Earth. Besides gravity from the Sun and Moon, the largest planet, Jupiter, also pulls on Earth. But our Moon greatly reduces the forces of Jupiter. Mars is not so lucky. Without the stabilizing influence of a large Moon, Mars is more vulnerable to the forces of Jupiter and larger planets. And now I'll, I'll force it. Dr. Wisdom simulates those forces on Mars's angle of rotation, or obliquity, using a string. If we begin to force the gyroscope by uh, swaying this, the string, then the gyroscope will undergo very large variations in obliquity. That's analogous to Mars. So the current, even 25 degree tilt of Mars's axis is only temporary. Its tilt actually varies over millions of years. Those large variations cause Mars's North Pole to roll over, point at the Sun, and then roll back again. And so Mars has an axis that's chaotically tilting. Its rotation axis is chaotically changing wildly from zero to 60 degrees and back and forth, and it's tipping over on its side on geologic timescales. It's actually quite frequent. So if the Earth didn't have the stabilizing moon, would we be more like Mars? Without the shield of a moon's gravity, Earth becomes vulnerable to other, more powerful forces in the universe. Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, begins to take over. It's separated from Earth only by smaller planet Mars. And because it's 11 times wider and over 300 times heavier than Earth, its gravity overwhelms Earth. So when Jupiter lines up just right with the other planets beyond it,